Yeah. All right. Well, thank you and uh, a pleasure again being here with you. Uh, what I'm going to show today is very much a work in progress. So take it, take it as it is. You know, it's the first time I'm presenting it in this sort of holistic form. So be patient with me and uh, try to contribute as well to, to, to the exercise. Uh, what I want to share with you, it's really a sharing uh, experience, is all what refers to communal and collective forms of land tenure. I would say non-individual regimes on, on land. And its relation to the right to adequate housing and beyond to the right to the city. The two pictures that you see here are for me quite symbolic and they are very unique because these are the only two cities I know of which are of communal property still today. One is Letchworth Garden City, the first garden city which was envisioned as a CLT, as a community land trust and still is today and I'm going to make a case on, on it and share with you. It's a place where I work a lot and uh, the other one is in Pune, is Margapata city, so you have like 100 years between these two. And both are 30,000 inhabitants, 35,000 inhabitants. And this is the result of a plan of the Margas who decided to put their land together to get a proper city. So these are the two cases, so it's very limited as an object in relation to the multiple cities that exist in the world. Apart from that, you have multiple regimes of land ownership, <coughs> not uh, individual, but in terms of cities, these are the two only cases that have reference upon. And uh, I would like to maybe have your contributions if you know other, other anyone. What I try to do in this 40 minutes, and I mean you can interrupt and ask questions if, if you wish, is literally to give you an account of the theoretical and empirical importance of these collective communal cooperative forms of land tenure, and position the, the, the issue in relation to the right to housing and the right to the city, share the advancement of this work in progress. I've been <coughs> tempted to do an quite an ambitious and probably over ambitious work uh, is to propose a reason classification of what is non-individual forms of tenure of land worldwide and then I would like to identify with you gaps and challenges for fu future research and action and hopefully mobilize people and resources on that because I consider it a very understudied and quite essential issue today um, particularly in relation to the right to housing and right to the city. My first question is, will 2013 be a turning point in relation to communal, cooperative and collective forms of land tenure? Why? Because if you look at internationally the, the international laws which exist or even the Declaration of Human Rights and the right to housing, basically the, the paradigm is the right to housing will be achieved with a very sound property rights system. Implicitly, individual property rights. And today, what has been, uh, uh, what has been uh, clearly demonstrated, and we are a small group working with a special rapporteur on housing, who is the office in Geneva, uh, dealing directly with the General Assembly of the UN. So it's not a technical kind of body, it's the political place which addresses the government in, 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 uh, in, in the UN, in uh, the government of the world in the UN in New York. So it's politically quite essential if you want to give a drift, a change to the international uh, law and the consideration of governments to be in this forum. And um, basically, the, the, 
the foundations of the right to housing linked to a system of property rights and individual rights with a kind of long-term freehold being the condition to get you to achieve the right to housing is totally wrong and this is something which is uh, important to, to, to note because you have people who have a property right and who are being evicted others who have a property right in places which are not habitable and therefore there are two new lines of research which are developed today one is this one the collective and communal forms of tenure as a way to achieve the right to housing so and link to a rights-based approach. And the other one is consideration of tenants, which are out of the system of property rights. So you have two big areas of research today on those interested in the right to housing and, and beyond that are being discussed. And for the first time, first time, <coughs> as incredible as it looks, uh, in the last General Assembly, the Special Rapporteur made her report, annual report to the all the governments of the planet on something related to uh, collective forms of tenure. So it's a kind of a re revolution, if, 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 you, if I may, within the whole story of how to achieve housing rights. Okay. So the report is here. I was in charge of preparing the uh, kind of world overview of the different communal and, and collective forms of tenure, and this is what I'm sharing with you. Okay. To So politically, that's quite essential, and, and for an activist and, and, academic, and scholar like myself, this is an ach achievement of years of lobby that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you. To have the, the governments of the planet listening to these two things is, <laughs> could be a change in the, international, uh, in the international declaration of human rights, not less than that. And I can expand on that, on how you achieve changes in the declaration. The first is that. It says in the General Assembly, states should support cooperative, collective, and communal forms of tenure. First time. Before it was, I mean, property rights are the good way to achieve uh, uh, the right to housing. By designing, investing adequate resources through legal recognition, protection of cooperative and collective ownership of land and housing in urban areas, and support for housing policy and financial mechanisms including access to credit and state, st state subsidies. So back to state subsidies, which is I mean, uh, not very much in the, in the mood of privatization and non-welfare states. So it's kind of a counter direction which is being taken. And to reach that in, in the assembly, it's, it's interesting. In states, tax benefits to collective institutions, state provision of technical assistance and urban land that is well located for collective housing organizations. Okay. So what the government is going to, to, to do with that, what, are they going to take it as a tool, or but you as well as academics saying there's a change internationally, a recognition is, is a point in, in an open. And the second recommendation is just as important Cooperative and collective forms of tenure are inextricably linked to enhance democratic participation. So very rarely you had that, you know, like a political issue related to a more technical one. And community-led governance. States should therefore support activities of civil society organizations that play a crucial role in the development and maintenance of collective forms of tenure, in particular for low-income groups. So usually when you reach that in the General Assembly, I mean, the activists are using it to say, hey, this is what the UN say and the UN wants. So when you work with the government and say, have you read that? What do you think of it? You are in a different position. I want to elaborate on that, on that particular basis. Um, <clears throat> from more a theoretical point of view, uh, Given that there's lots of definition on what is common property, common property regimes, etc., uh, you will find that in the papers that I send as a, as a possible readings. But basically, I'm using Ostrom definition, you know, on, on which is, I suppose, well known in, in this country. Um, basically, 
or on both the drama of the commons and a, a very interesting paper on the framework of for analyzing the, the, the microbiological commons, you know, in, in, from uh, 206. Uh, what is interesting in her, def uh, in her definition is that common property is defined as a formal or informal regime. And for those working in developing countries, it's quite essential to, rec to, to, to recognize the informality of some regimes. Mm. That, that, that's an important theoretical uh, contribution that allocates a package of rights to a group. Such rights may include, and this is again a kind of an interesting unpacking from an analytical point of view, ownership, management, use, exclusion, exchange, and access of shared resources. And then common property regime, which refers not to the resource itself, but to the set of institutions, regulation, and management practices. So a good separation between what is the wealth and the way to manage it. You know. So that's, again, I mean, a contribution of, of Austria. Yeah, I think that's, that's enough. I mean, there are other, other authors, but they are not which are important, but I don't want to expand too much on that side. All right. In, in order to understand what I'm going to say, uh, we need to unpack and spend, I mean, just one or two minutes on what is the right to housing. Usually, I mean, the common sense is to say, well, it's to provide a shelter, you know, the right to housing as a quantitative sort of issue. And it's not exactly the, the case. If you want really to deal and see the benefit of collective and communal forms of tenure, you need to unpack and not relate to shelter per se, but to, this, to the various pillars of what is a decent, uh, a decent place to live, which is basically security of tenure, long term, availability of services, materials, facilities, and infrastructure. So it's not only the house, but all the services around. But then it, it has a dialogue with the city. Affordability, which is an issue which in the US is quite you know, very familiar with it, you know, affordable housing and affordable laws in this country are probably, I mean, for me, uh, one of the good examples of interesting policies, even if they are not always applied. You know. uh, habitability. This is much more qualitative, which allows you to have an interesting debate on the qualitative deficit of housing in the world, which is superior than the quantitative one. Accessibility, to jobs, accessibility to, to the city, say. location, and cultural adequacy. So when you unpack the notion of what internationally is housing, then it's interesting to have a kind of link with communal forms of tenure and how they contribute not only to security of tenure, which was the exercise that I was in charge of for the General Assembly, but to a much broader sense. Now, the big shortfall that you have on communal forms of tenure in relation to the city is that when you look at the system, in the UN system, you have nowhere a clear reference to the city per se. Land is basically in urban related to residential use. You need the old consumption of land for housing. But if you try to say, hang on, the city should be a productive place, and yesterday we had a, a debate on that, well, I proposed when uh, I nearly refused to do this job and say, hey, what is important is people to feed themselves, I mean, and to be fed properly with nutritious food. Where is the land for f urban land for food? Nowhere. And so they say, no, this is not our mandate. We are sorry. We like you a lot, but uh, <laughs> not paying for that. So get that out. Say, yeah, but all right. Okay. Then, but, then I said, okay, but what about land for public uses? You know the. Democracy needs open spaces. Who is taking care of that bit, which normally is big in a city? No, no, it's not. No, we are land for housing, okay? So they, but it was interesting because they suppressed it from the proposal. So mm -hmm. it was for me a clear negation. I mean, negation? negation yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A clear negation of we're in the 21st century, 50% of the population lives in cities, etc., etc., big stuff, UN. No rights. So we're pushing 
on an agenda which would be at least to protect those producers in cities on urban agriculture to get also, I mean, something on communal and collective lands of, uh, and, uh, and collective rights. You see, so it's a very restrictive work work in relation to what it could be, and this is probably an agenda which still has to be worked out. But it, it's nowhere in the system. Mm -hmm. Even when you speak with a very good guy with the special rapporteur on food security, uh, De Schwitter, really excellent. Um, uh, traditionally, food was rural. And he said, okay, but we all agree now that, and I just made a book for FAO on that, you know, on urban and rural linkages and all. They said, you're right, but there, it's not in the mandate. So you have big holes in cities on land rights. And so consider what it is. It's a very small piece in relation with what it should be. Right? So it's a limitation, which is, uh, which is serious. <coughs> All right. What I've tried to do, and help me on that, because I, I, I'm, it's really a sharing exercise. I've been trying to look at what exists in the world, which is non-individual regimes, and trying to organize that in a reasoned, reasoned way. And proposed an organization with, that could become a typology and uh, that are really different. I mean, the, these categories, maybe the third one is not. So what I would like to do is just introduce these five large categories and then come to some limitations. And you know most of them. So what I did is try to bring to, the, to, to, to here maybe some experiences that you might less know in, in the US, you know, even if I know that many of you are not from the US. Um, so let's say that the co-op regimes, I mean, cooperative housing in this country exists, but I'm referring to two families of, of regimes which I think important because they have been influential, because they are one well, of the oldest ones and still uh, very strong. <coughs> one is the Scandinavian model. You know, HSB in, in, in Sweden was uh, set up in 1923-something, so nearly 100 years ago, so pretty consolidated. And if you look today in, in, in Sweden, 22% of the housing stock is uh, co-op. So it, it's, it's decent for, for the country. And the model is called mother and daughter cooperative. Is, is that something that you are familiar with? Mm -hmm. in, in here? So this has been a model which is largely the one which is reproduced. You go to the Philippines, you go to other places, which is the, the system uh, well, from the Nordic countries for sure. But many countries in the world as well. So just drawing your attention on that. Um, so the mother co-op association are responsible for building housing developments, which are then sold to daughters, also known as subsidiary or primary co-ops. The daughter co-ops often purchase management and administration services from mother co-ops, which helps to preserve the organization relationship, although they are not obligated to do so. Tenants are members of the mother and daughter co-ops, and the model is also notable for combining housing and savings schemes with one organization. What is important is here the financial risk for members is limited to their daughter co-op. You know? So it's like if you have a whole site and, uh, and, and smaller ones. This model has been expanding, but it's not the most interesting one because fundamentally um, mm. with the the Nordic system and the Swiss system today are being largely privatized and they are not at all with the sort of cooperative ideals, you know, the principles that uh, were existing or still existing in, in, in countries like the UK in, um, for some co-ops, etc. So it's very much medium, um, they, they put that, uh, they, they, they put the shares on the market and today you have medium income, upper medium income people who are living in co-ops. It's not at all the low-income kind of tradition that was at the welfare state uh, moment. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, if, if we make a typology, we need to, to, to look at the whole thing, you know. But uh, it's not 
it's not the most interesting in terms of access of the, of the poor to a decent, uh, a decent city. Much more interesting, much by far, much more interesting, is the Uruguayan model. The, the, this model would be the equivalent for me of Porto Alegre for participatory budgeting, if I may. Uh, what it brings is that you can either, you have two types of co-ops, one of the saving types, which are you mean high-rise building, etc. But if you don't have money, you can substitute saving for labor. All right, so they are called mutual aid cooperative. So instead of saving, you bring 20 hours a, a, a month, a, a week, sorry, it depends, but just to give you a, a rough reference. And your work will be transformed into a, a social good. You know, so it's, it's a very elaborated sort of, of system of production. <coughs> so it's usually a collective process with, a lot, with a, an interesting aspect for in gender and women working and being, a, and being part of the process and leading the process. <coughs> and uh, ownership is collective and indivisible. So you have really the, the old, strong, uh, pre basic principles of cooperativism which are um, on that. High proportion mutual aid co-ops are users of sole mortgage co-ops, which means that the ownership of the houses and therefore the responsibility of the mortgage is from the co-op as a whole and not from each individual member. Because in the 60s, and it was the herb of resistance against dictatorship, the, uh, the co-ops were for the first time in Latin America able to get a law by which the bank, the housing bank, was giving loans to this sole unit called the co-op. So if somebody defaults, it's the co-op who is responsible. Right? So, it, so it changed the whole thing. You know, it became the, the subject of credit, we call that in Latin America, per se. All right, since, just to give you a scale, since uh, 1965, 600 foot van co-ops have been consolidated in Uruguay as a whole. 20,000 families, 70,000 people are living in the houses and apartments built through mutual aid. People who have been building collectively their homes with very interesting uh, condo rules, I mean co-op rules of occupation. And this is a significant number in a country of 3.4 million inhabitants. Mm -hmm. uh, very strong long-term security of tenure. And what is quite interesting is that it has been expanding with adaptation in a, dozen, in a good dozen of Latin American countries. So if, if, if you want to follow what's happening in, in Latin America, this is the case. And I was working in, in Brazil, as a matter of fact, expanding and working with them, but in, in North of Brazil on, on, on co-ops during nearly 10 years. <coughs> Very strong movement. So they work at policy level, which is pretty unique. And on, on, on real operation. This is the this is Brazil, and that's a project I was involved in, where we try to produce bits of city. Not only housing, but full community land trust with collective ownership with the landless movement. And that was a garbage dump. Uh, and, and it had the best practice award after long years of being obscurely working. Uh, this is the equivalent in Brazil of Mutirões, strongly, with very strong uh, movements, which are reproducing a model very similar. What I want to insist upon is that this is self-built by people, and it's high-rise. So you have very rare high-rise systems. You have a good number, but these ones are, are interesting way of producing cities, which is not the old image, you know, self-help is individual houses, you know, this is a big, big story here. And uh, <coughs> this is the sign that is in Belo Horizonte, and for those of you interested in participatory budgeting, and remember the, the nexus that I tried to build between uh, different approaches, housing, co-ops, and uh, PB or PBNF and agriculture, here you have a, a 
around 10 cases of self-managed um, housing development, which were self-built with resources from PBE. And there's a specific participatory budgeting for housing for landless people, homeless people, sorry, uh, which is quite unique. With, so just to show you the diversity of solution, this is a kind of unique. When you say self-built, uh, the skill set to, to self-build a high-rise, you won't find in your average group of no. prospective owners. So how do they mix self-building with the professional? Mm -hmm. well, in, in various ways. The <clears throat> number one is that they part, first, part of the people on the, on the list have so many times skills. So this is the first, the first package. Then uh, you have a second uh, portion with, which are trained to, to become. So in that sense, the uh, housing becomes a field of training. So it's not only a, an end product, but it's a means to develop <coughs> training capacities. And, uh, and it works, uh, actually. Usually it works relatively well at a fraction of a additional cost. And the third is that what is lacking is contracted. Mm -hmm. right, so it will depend totally on, on the places. And, uh, and I can expand on that, you know, the rules on how it, it works uh, <coughs> normally. And this is a pretty unique uh, experience in the world, you know. Uh, you have the Diadema in Sao Paulo and Belo Horizonte, but those are interesting. Mm -hmm. Mutual aid co-op built by people and, uh, and, and, and high-rise, interesting, and very interesting uh, in terms of communal uh, land, uh, very interesting setting up of rules for the management beyond and the maintenance, very unique, and totally understudied. If you try to, to, to find this information, it's understudied. I know um, it's nobody studying that, very, very few. Now, let's go to the second, so very thin on, on co-ops, co because I think that this is the most well-known. The second large regime are community land trusts. Very, I mean, the country where you have got more community land trusts is probably the US, particularly uh, from the 80s, and I'm glad that Greg Rosenberg is here with us, because Greg is, has just done a, a right you? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, has done a, a very interesting uh, piece of research, at least when uh, it was produced. I mean, a couple of, of pieces of research on community land trust. And so, I mean, for the city of Madison, probably you are a good asset for, for, the, the, for here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's circulating well. So, uh, <laughs> please compliment at a point in time you know, in, the, in the debate, because you know much more than I do on, on, on community land trust. But uh, what I want to draw your attention upon is this, Letchworth. Mm. Because it's the only city I know which is a community land trust. You can have housing CLTs, mm -hmm. non-housing, mm -hmm. but never a city which is envisioned as a community land trust. And it has been there for 120 years. And it's the result of socialism debates. And uh, Lenin was, for instance, in, in, uh, at the early times in uh, <coughs> In, in Letchworth and the Bolsheviks were there, the uh, utopian socialists uh, were part of it. So you have a whole <laughs> moment of history there and meeting the Quakers. I mean, it's very interesting uh, mm -hmm. social history for those of you interested. Uh, and the result is there. Mm -hmm. And when you compare Letchworth with the other garden cities, it's the only one that distantly you can say still it's, uh, it's a garden city. Most of them become other things, even Welling Garden City, the second one after the, after the war, was basically for the survivors from uh, the English survivors from the First World War, and the government saw the subversive element that was in, and I have the, the text you know, as I work precisely on that, uh, I have the text, you know, on, on, of the government who decided to have the same nice design, you know, chocolate boxes, uh, arts and crafts, uh, organic design, etc., which is 
I mean, what is nice you know, in, in, in the whole history of garden cities, but what disappeared was the CIT, was the communal and collective ownership of land. So what you are seeing here is something like, something just before the uh, October Revolution, and then was the First World War, and then it was the end of it, the end of the utopia. Okay, but this one is still there. So as I know that uh, when I discuss with, Dave, with John, you know, Davis, I mean, who's the guy in this country on, on CLTs, this is something he doesn't know much of. So I, I know that it's new for, for the US. Community land trust, not from profit, community controlled organization. So it's, a, it's an organization, it's a real estate. And for me, it's a real estate organization, but it's controlled by the community. We'll come back to that. Uh, that owns, develops, and manages local assets for the benefit of the local community. Its objective is to acquire land and property and hold it in trust for the benefit of a defined locality or community in perpetuity. And this, for long term security of tenure, is absolutely essential. You know, the locking of subsidies long term. What is quite interesting, it has a notion of locality. So it's not like a co op, a self built, kind of enclosed but it has a dialogue with the city as a whole. And Burlington, in that sense, is quite interesting because it's spatial-based. It's not like the units that we saw, which are just small dots on the city. You know, it, 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 it's much more spatial and more city-like, <coughs> potentially. What is unique and different from most of the co-ops is, and very much linked to the Anglo-Saxon the basis of, of the law, is CLT separates the value of the land from the building that stands on it. This is the major, one of the major contribution of, of, of CLTs. The land is uh, not a commodity, you don't pay for it, basically, and it's in, in, in indivisible property. And what is built on it is, uh, can be leased, sold, can be used in a wide range of circumstances to preserve the value of any public and private investment, as well as planning gain and land appreciation for community benefit. Crucially, local residents and businesses are actively involved in planning and delivering affordable local housing, workspaces, and community facility. What is quite interesting with CLTs is that it's not limited to housing but to workplaces, to community places, and this makes a big difference. Um, that, that's the, uh, the, the, I would say, the main contribution. Now, if you look at CLTs, and I will compare, just an, as, as an example, three of them. One in Canada, here, I mean, um, in, in Burlington, which is one of the largest ones, and, um, <coughs> and Letchworth, that I mentioned to you, all right? So, Three places where the land is owned in, 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 in trust. In, um, in Letchworth, none of the buildings are co-ops. None of them. Okay. In Milton Park, in Quebec, right in the center, which is the largest in, uh, and the most interesting in Canada, you have 22 co-ops housing, non-housing, coffee shops, etc., which are the owners of the land in an indivisible way. So you have 100% co-ops. In Letchworth, 0%, 0% co-ops. And if you look at Burlington, today, I mean, according to the latest information, you have only out of the whole stock, I'll come back to that, five or six small co-ops which are there. Mm -hmm. So you see, what you need to grab here is the sort of link between CLTs and co-op. It's not mechanical. All right, and this is quite interesting. And I was convinced when I went to Burlington, when they were saying, hey, co-op housing is a kind of an advanced social dream, social utopia that not everybody is sharing. So let's leave that in, 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 uh, as a possibility. And so this is quite interesting to compare, no comparison yet, Milton Park, Burlington, and, and Letchworth in the link between the land and the co-op model on top of it. All right, 1902, Letchworth, 
the, the green belt around the around the city. Um, 5,300 acres, 33,000 inhabitants. Interestingly enough, uh, 120 years later, and as a planner, I can tell that it's probably the only miraculous place I know where the planners were not wrong, you know, and they planned a city which was exactly, which is the size that was planned. If you go to most of the places which are cities planned, usually they are a small dot in a very much bigger thing or not, they are not built. But here we have a kind of an interesting planning exercise, which is a city for workers, not for only you know, like Brasilia, for people living in it, but consumers of the city here. Half of the land is for farms and agriculture, half of it, not bad. And still 120 years later, you have half of the land which is cultivated. It is the industrial zone where you find the bottom end, I mean manual workers around London, not you know, being sent to China or whatever. No, you have here an industrial zone with cheap labor still. If you want to repair a car or paint a car, etc., you can do it here. So it's quite interesting in terms of the model of city which was made possible and pretty unique in relation to other cities. Now, the land is held in trust, and anybody using it will pay a lease, all right? much higher than in, in the CLT in, in, in the US. So basically, you have a revenue, which varies six, nine million pounds a year, which would be $10 million a year for a city of 33,000 inhabitants, it's quite high, which is redistributed and complement national policies. So the quality of life that you will find in uh, Letchworth is much higher than in their neighboring cities. You will find a, a movie theater, you will find a hospital, you will find free transport for some people, um, grants for kids who want to study, etc., etc. So it's, it's, it's quite, quite interesting to see how you can generate value which will go to the benefit of the people because it's a trust. And so in terms of contribution to the right to housing and beyond to the right to the city, it's absolutely a clear demonstration. You see, this, is, this was last year, half an hour from St. Pancras station, you know, half an hour. value 110 million pounds of what the heritage the trust is, is, is having and the annual income around yes 10 million uh, 10 million euros. and what is spent on the community is 4 million rent distributed for the services I was telling you plus educational fund for the kids to study etc etc What are the limits of the exercise? You know, in trying to, to have some distance to these real utopias, as Eric is inviting in one of his papers. Uh, in the 20s, the garden cities should have been multiplied. They did not with the same model. So that's a, that's a pretty harsh statement. They didn't expand. They were supposed to work together and to have small cities competing with London as a, as a mass. Was the idea is to have all these cities connected together to make it accountable. Uh, in the 50s, because of the community power that was existing, people didn't want social housing anymore. So that's another serious issue to consider. You know, when you get better off, self gentrified. And then you say, stop, we don't want uh, the poor around here. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. so. <coughs> and, and, and this is not the, the normal narrative that I'm putting on the table, but we sit with the ex-mayor, a friend of mine, extremely radical, and we say, let's see, let's try to see what is not wrong, but what needs to be discussed. You know? So that's what they're <coughs> 
Uh, and then, ironically, the Labour government was opposed to, to the heritage views on uh, maintaining a gentrification of the place. You know, it was a, a time where you had social housing which was still booming, and so you had a, a city which was refusing, which was refusing to build on the remain on the land to have the poor. I mean, social housing. Okay, who, who, has, who needs to have the right? Uh, do we play on the community-based, uh, and community has the power, or uh, politically uh, more socially oriented? Stuff? So, interesting debate to, to, to think about. In the 60s, somebody tried to buy the shares, the whole city. I said, okay, I buy it and improve it. But it was stopped. In the 70s, Part of the land of the trust was lost. Uh, people could buy their lease and get freeholds. So today, <coughs> when you look at uh, Ledgeworth, as a matter of fact, the residential areas are most of them freeholds. They are not, people don't pay anymore. And the value of the 7 million or 10 million US that I was telling you are coming much more from the activities for the benefit of people. It's a double system, but the original plan is not there anymore. A couple of are still there because new developments have been done and the new guys in the heritage want to keep these sort of original ideals, but it, it, in 100 years it changes. In the 80s, strong tensions between a double management. For the people who want to repair their homes, they need to go through the heritage rules and the national rules. And I have here a, a, a study, and well, that I know, okay, that was a research. And, uh, and the result of the research is that people are really against the double system of having your house being, if you want to repaint it or maintain it in the heritage part, you need to go through an endless system. And when the public sector, the government, is against what the community wants, how do you solve that? Big, big mess. Mm. Because you are still, you know, it's, it's an island of self-management between a country. On CLTs, I, I, I suggest that we go back uh, in the debate on CLTs in the US and maybe uh, to have uh, Greg expanding. Uh, they have been expanding sin since the 80s, more, I mean, they were before, but at urban level. Still small in size, in terms of global numbers, uh, I would say it's, uh, it's not as much as, uh, for instance, the uh, Uruguayan cooperatives, you know, for the country as big, uh, not of 3.4 million inhabitants. So still small, but expanding swiftly, and uh, housing and non-housing. And probably the, the most interesting case is Burlington mm -hmm. in, in Vermont. And I think quite interesting to, to see that they have the whole rental apartments, <coughs> co-op apartments, condos and individual properties, commercial space, office, small retail shops. And the asset, I mean, jumped from $200,000 dollars in 84, which was given by uh, the, the local authority, Bernie Sanders, when he was mayor, to today uh, and, and assets which are probably in the range, I mean, this is from 2007, in the range of 40, between 40 and 50 million dollars, which is quite significant. Mm -hmm. so you have bits of pieces which are there, and it works well. <coughs> it's for basically people below the median, median uh, income, local median income, and this is something which, I mean, for those who are non-Americans, this is fabulous to get a program which is capped and which is for those below the median. When you try to do that in Belgium, we couldn't do it. Mm. You don't reach that level, you go, be, you go upper mm. to have the model working, so it's really interesting to have a solution which is for below the median income in, some, in a place. This being said, it's uh, for families usually between 30 to 80 percent of the median income. Right? You don't reach the poorest of the poor either, or exceptionally. 
And what is quite unique and doesn't exist in many places is the resale formula. You pay less because you don't pay for the land, but if your houses has been doubling in value, you can get only up to 25% of the increase in value and the rest goes to the CLTs as, as a way to, um, to have it working. Which is very different from the, from the Uruguayan, Uruguayan co-ops, you know. In a Uruguayan co-ops, if you leave, you will get all the social value, what is called social value of your house. All the hours that you've worked, the 20 hours per week, you get them at the minimum salary. You get the equivalent of if a company had been hiring you, so there is no saving, you know, all the social security, taxes, etc., etc. You get that. You get all the loans that you've been paying, because you can get a loan on top of, of, of your work. The interest of the loans, the, the cost of the interest of the loans, so this is the social value. And you will get half of it when you leave, half of it three years later. Okay? Mm. So it's, it's, it's pretty different in that, in that case. So this is, and you have the other model, which is the Swede model, where you have this, um, where you pay whatever the nature of your home, you pay 35% of your income. Well, that, that's very serious, you know, it's a big debate within the car movement of uh, everybody's paying the same, but if I have one kid or five kids, I will have a large room, a small room. If I have a very small income, I pay 35, and you pay for the others. You need a kind of a certain vision. You know, on that. What is unique, very different, and for me, it's one of the key, and we're trying to promote that uh, everywhere in the world, is the model of the, the power model very different from the co-op, and I think that this is truly a contribution of, the, of, of your country and, uh, to, to, to the communal forms of tenure, which is uh, the trap trapezoidal power. In other words, one third of the votes in the board that controls the, the, the CLT are coming from the beneficiaries, which would be the co-op the, the, the co members, you know, those living in the houses or mm -hmm. those living in the uh, in, uh, or of those using a commercial space. So like inward looking sort of co-op. But what was done, which I think a major contribution to local governance, is that you have two other thirds. Another third which would be people from the city which are interested in this idea of, of having uh, CLTs and which contribute to the project, even if they don't live or are direct beneficiaries of the, of the CLT and one third of people representing the public interest. And this was a big struggle in Brussels. I, try, I worked on that as an advisor, and uh, the first uh, European CLT, non-Anglo-Saxon, uh, is now working in Brussels, and that was a big battle, <coughs> and a big division of, of waters to get that model and to get the public sector accepting that they are only going to control one third of the CLT. That, that's a major victory in terms of introduction of new models on, on community land trust. What is fascinating in terms of the right to the city and the right to housing is that, and I think that you contributed to that work, uh, Greg, mm -hmm. you? Yeah, you, were, you are the one on that. Uh, the capac capacity to regulate the market and its dramatic effects number of foreclosures in the US, well, it's five million today, something like that, we said yesterday, and significantly less in CLCs and no houses foreclosed in Burlington-based THT. Nine families lost their homes in total. It was one third, it was one eighth of the national average with CLT foreclosure. In one year it was one thirtieth. Yeah. And yeah, one eighth and one thirtieth, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, it, it, it shows that as the social economy is doing, and, 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 and you were mentioning Mondragon, and there's a book which is called The Debt Trap, that I really encourage you to read, The Debt, Debt Trap, which is showing that within the financial crisis in the developed countries, the only sector which is resisting is precisely the social economy sector. 
And, that's, and now we have the data on that, like this one, which is extremely precious. Now, let's go quickly to three other categories, which compose this first <coughs> sort of organized satire. Uh, one is coming from Asia. I would say the equivalent of the Uruguayan model, in the sense that it exists in 14, 14 15 countries. So it's not small. And uh, it is a really grassroots originated movement which were, was able to, lo able to lobby the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights and a large program called ha Asian Coalition for Community Action, ACA. And in three years, 36 out of 111 big projects reached collective agreements. 42,000 families in total. And uh, there were nice precedent from the Ban Makong program in, in, in Thailand with Cody. Um, and with Cody, 100,000 households in Thailand, 44 had cooperative land ownership. So when internationally we see like this sort of finance is the way, privatization is the way to produce housing, as a matter of fact, internationally, this is not exactly the, the image. You know? Unfortunately, and these are the challenges, documentation is totally limited. We, we couldn't get information you know, to know exactly the, the nature of the land ownership, even if you know it's communal, it's collective. There is no information in that, even if it's large. Mostly on national languages, it's in Thai, it's in Cambodian, it's in uh, Urdu. Very difficult to get the, the substance of it. You know, it's, an, it's an empty field of research. And we don't understand the, the nature of the collective arrangements this time. And we try to get it, but it's very limited, like nothing serious, even for a publication. And uh, there is no hard facts, evidence of contribution to right to housing and, and beyond, or right to the city. We think it's good. But there is no clear evidence that people stay there that if I take my seven criteria of the right to housing, I mean, intuitively, yes, and anecdotes, yes. But to make an authoritative paper and, and, and or contribution to the UN or to policies, we don't have the data. And I, I prefer to say it and, and say, this is an, an explored field of research. Not that difficult to do, but there is no resource to do it, no money on that. And so if we are interested in saying, it's not only through individual ownership that you can reach the right to the city and the right to housing, we still have to demonstrate it, and it's not done. So it's an encouragement of those in, in research to say, hey, okay, we have an experimental field, but um, this on, on that, and I'm trying hard to get, but it doesn't go beyond anecdote or casuism, I mean, one case, two cases, but nothing that you can say, well, this is it, you know. It's a pity because you are not, we cannot convince or even reflect to improve. Now, there's a, a very, very unexplored sector, and that was part of the result of this research, is that when you look at uh, communal tenure, you know, customary rights and customary lands, if I take the definition of Anderson, it refers to a situation where a group holds secure and exclusive collective rights to own, manage, use land and natural resources as a common pool of resources, agricultural land, grazing lands, forests, trees, fisheries, wetland, irrigation waters, communal tenure can be customary and age old, each rule relying community decision or it can be newly designed for a specific purpose. But my point is, with the expansion of cities, in many countries you get large plots of lands which are under customary rules. Some, some countries, like ironically Bolivia, are destroying this. They say in urban area, no customary rights. So they prohibited the old customary rules, you know, of indigenous rules for urban areas. So that's, that's one way to look at it. It doesn't. It's prohibited. So you cannot have a right which is an ancillary right, a customary right. But in some places, you have an interesting use 
and transformation of rights for urban uses. And so we find back, not housing, but a large place to, to, to live, produce, etc. And here I would like to mention, and I want, don't want to expand too much, uh, I didn't expand too much on Ejidos, which was this uh, communal land resulting from the Mexican Revolution, because I suppose that this is more well known here. They were privatized, as you know, the article in the Constitution, Book 7, was, uh, was, private, uh, was the privatization of this, uh, of Ejidos, allowing the farmers, and it was the same with indigenous land, uh, allowing the farmers to sell the land. What is interesting, and I have evidence on that, but it needs research that I hope to do very soon. Um, despite that, when you look what happened after Salinas had that voted in Mexico, uh, still ejidatarios, these common uh, own, the, 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 the owners, haven't been selling that much. Mm -hmm. It's much more complex. And on the contrary, they have been finding new ways to resist. So it's a very interesting field of research to look into to see how I mean, the people, despite the, pot the, the possibility of the privatization, people haven't been selling that much. And, and many interesting issues there, OK? Just this. A much more serious uh, issues in, with China, with the expansion of cities, obviously there were lots of tensions with the communes, which is not an ownership, but which land is the ownership of the of the of China itself you have a lease a right of use and this right of use was collective and now a very interesting uh, a very interesting experiments are taking place called uh, it's Chinese but uh, it could be translated shareholders co-ops co co which means that uh, the people, instead of having a kind of indivisible land or an indivisible lease or right of use, now are shareholders of this land, which is a double-edged double -edged process because it can be a way to facilitate the selling of the land, which is what the government wants. You know, so we sell the land as native uh, farmers and we get a profit. But at least it's a way to buy the people. And this has been one of the reasons why it was done. So in Beijing, for instance, it's, it's very clear. You have hundreds of them. So that's one. But in some places, like Chengdu, where I just spent one month, it's a way to redevelop land. And they have been doing something extremely interesting, which is the unpacking of this uh, indivisible communal land, splitting into three parts, actually. One is the land that is arable land, which is produced, which is still indivisible, and, but the benefit will be of the shareholders, each one having the same amount. And another part will be for the houses and around my houses, and some of the, of the villages. So you have three status of land, from very private to still collective. And the results with the participatory budgeting, which is poured into that, and for the villagers to improve their land, has been doing very interesting, very, very interesting results. Again, uh, 60,000 projects financed through PB in four years, and no research virtually. Mm -hmm. just, we just produced a paper with my colleagues from China, but it's this in relation with what it should be. Uh, it's a mass of of extremely interesting situation there. The other issue is, again, the gentrification issue, which is the following. I mean, these assets-based co-ops, as they are called in China as well, are for the native hukus, uh, for those who have the certificate of residence. So the newcomers with temporary titles, all the floating populations are, are not eligible. Mm. So as a matter of fact, when I look at that, I mean, globally, you take Chengdu, 17 million inhabitants, five, six million of them being uh, migrants, either floating or non-floating. These guys are out of the system. Mm. And when you go to small villages, you will find the villagers I mean, getting richer because the land is either sold or being productive. 
And then you have the masses of these ex-rural people who are there. So in terms of new division of the, of the society and classes, it's something that would deserve a, a closer kind of a look. All right? But at the same time, it gave, it gave power to the people. <clears throat> the last in this customary tenure is um, something very little known. There was, there's one research on that by a colleague from Bangalore. It's called the uh, Margapata city. Here you are newly in utopias. And to make the very, I mean, it's, it's quite an interesting story because it's in a satellite city from Pune, the second, the second city in the state of Maharashtra. So it's a large city. And uh, there was a clan, truly a clan with the Margas, which were having large pieces of land. And they decided to get together and to design their own city as a clan. They didn't go into co-ops. They went into private sort of company with, as shareholders. But they control the land. And they make development with a city of the same size of Burlington, same size of Letchworth, and, and this one, 30, 35,000 inhabitants. It's a coincidence, probably. But probably, but maybe not, in terms of the size of our utopia in the urban field. You know, we have three there, which are quite interesting to compare. What is interesting here is that at the same time you have development, but you have rainwater collection, you have biogas at the city's level, you have uh, uh, solar energy, all these, gim um, not the gimmicks, but the components of an eco-friendly kind of city are there and nowhere else. And that was made possible because of this clan, 183 members of the clan that were able to get together to put enough land for building a city. And it's for me one of the other way to reflect on how to transform customary land into, into, into cities. And my last category is uh, something slightly more complex, um, probably for, uh, in, in legal terms. Are you familiar with what is called uh, user caption? or uh, adverse, 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 adverse property. Adverse. I don't know how you use it here. You know, there are so many words to, say, to adverse say this. Adverse possession. Adverse possession? Yeah, adverse possession. Or adverse uh, possession. I mean, it, it depends on, on, on the literature and, and, and the well, Basically, this is quite interesting and very unique what I'm showing you here, is that you, get, you can get a collective right and a quasi-ownership. Use a is, uh, I, I don't say it's an ownership, even if texts say it, um, worked on it in Brazil, and it's a quasi-ownership that you can get through the use, okay? It's because you get to use, so it's, going, it, it's an old Roman law, largely normally the Portuguese civil code, so something which has a very s strong roots. It was made possible through the city status, stated in a uh, law in, in Brazil. And uh, Basically, it, it, it works like that for the requirements. Users, if you occupy a piece of land peacefully, if the <coughs> owner, and, and in, in, in an uninterrupted way, is, if there hasn't been any claim from the formal owner, and you've been developing that land, this use, which comes from the old Roman uh, laws, might be turned, the fact of using it, might make you eligible to get the <coughs> ownership through the use. It exists in different countries, but for individual, individually. And here, and that was a long struggle from the 80s, uh, from, from after, the, the, uh, after the dictatorship, if you have been, and, and this, if you have been living in a piece of land collectively for over five years, you're eligible to get to be the owner. Before it was 15 years, then it went to 10 years, and now it's five years. So it was in the law in 2001, and now we have uh, three cases 
of collective ownership of collective urban uzucapia in Brazil for low-income families which have been acquired through the use, reactivating this old Roman law principle that if you are using a piece of land, valuing it, I mean, you are eligible to be the owner. This is on private land, and you have the equivalent on public land. I don't want to go too much into the legal details on that, but I think that this is a very interesting avenue. No, stu no study. One, what, there's one, but it's more on, on the legal aspect. But hard evidence on what's happening in Olinda, in Santos. There is, hopefully, it will come up. But this is a very fertile uh, sector. So this would be there. Um, yeah, time is running. I would like to, to show a little bit of the risk of all these communal and collective forms of tenure in order to say that's not a, only a rosy sort of picture. So I try to identify, uh, my, with many colleagues, uh, it's not myself uh, only, uh, <coughs> As the mutual aid, even the mutual aid co-op, which are relatively radical, there's a risk of gentrification, which was detected. There's a paper from Sablon, which is quite interesting. It will be a new book that we're putting together on that. Um, because the social capital that I was telling you about, okay, all your hours and loans, etc., are given back to you through three years. But the newcomers, they need to pay the equivalent of the social value on day zero. Meaning what? Meaning that what was done through probably 10, 20 years, you know, with your work, with an additional loan, the newcomers need to be richer because they need to enter with that money. This is being discussed today uh, nationally, but uh, it's structurally a, a kind of a gentrification inbuilt, uh, which you don't have in CLTs, for instance. You know, the affordability is, is, is lowering. Uh, the second is that, and this is a good topic for, no research, a, a good topic for uh, uh, sociology particularly, is that you have Old Shacks Dwellers International, which is probably one of the largest social movements dealing with cities and housing that you've heard of, probably. They are very much in collective engagement and collective action to get pieces of land that they get as a whole site, as, as a collective plot. So during a, per, a, a period of time, it will be collected, or communal, or co-op. And then it's being broken into individual pieces. So you have here a case where collective action is a way to find, at the end of the day, a very conventional uh, private ownership system. What we do not know is that if, if it was better, and what are the consequences? But it's a mass. It, it, it's not small. You are speaking of thousands and thousands of cases. And the other big issue is that what do you do to avoid the privatization of the commons, like it's happening in Sweden? Because this is uh, striking hard, you know. And when you look even at the co-op models, which were in the eastern, uh, I mean, the ex-communist uh, countries, where co-ops is a way to privatize. So you have a whole set today of privatization of the commons through the, the, the cooperative model, which is quite preoccupying, and very little critical analysis is done on that. Yeah, there's need of research on the contribution of, of CCFT on the right to adequate housing beyond security of tenure, that's for sure. Uh, I said most of it. Yeah, expand the scope beyond the, the definition of land for housing. We should have at city-wide level the, this communal approach. And um, for policy and action ag agenda, how can we scale up what is being done? How we can make it visible in a system and not cases, you know, of Marga Pata here, the shareholders in China, etc., to show there is an alternative which is taking place and which is providing good results, but it's still a, 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 an open field. Inside. Yeah. This is it. Thank you very much. And sorry, because 
it's a first attempt. I mean, uh, that, that's, uh, it was over ambitious to put that together, and I'm the first conscious of it. So uh, already, you know, sorry. So when you were talking about the um, adverse position in Brazil, it strikes me similar to the idea that in a lot of South African communities, given a constitutional right to housing, you'll have an organized invasion of land yep. that never then seeks formal recognition, but almost then is a, is that a collective form of tenure? If it's an organized opposition and you're paying a lease to somebody who may or may not have formal rights of ownership. I mean, some of these are criminal syndicates, and some of them. I know. In, and it's not just South Africa, but that's the case that's been written about. I, I would say so, because once not, uh, the Uzugapian was, uh, is a solution precisely for the lack of deeds or the lack of title. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these solutions, you know, of organized uh, squatting of land, organized piratas, urbanizaciones uh, yeah. piratas in Latin America, and all that, all the gangs, and very common in India as well, are very different from the principle of Uzucapian, because Uzucapian, to get it, to get your right of use, nobody, I mean, to get it during your five years, if there is only one, the owner, asking for his land, then you, you are not eligible. So it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's not the tension that you, that you have. And, um, and it's true that in, in, in South Africa today, uh, even the Squatter Settlement, Kennedy Roads, and I mean, Abashlali movements, etc., are, from my point of view, they haven't been going to collective actions. And the homeless, interna and, uh, homeless international, I mean, the Feder uh, Federation is going to collective action to get a large piece of land, but then they are subdividing. So, and uh, I mean, for the, for the history, uh, when um, Mandela won, I was in Brazil, and we organized exchanges, and I was one of the technicians precisely to learn from Uzucapian for the invasion of the occupation of land and finding a way to get collective rights, it never worked. Mm. And there were exchanges in both ways, but it never worked. That was a, a lot of investment of energy for nothing. And, but it shows at the same time the need to continue having a dialogue and showing how it works and the benefit that people, people can have and local authorities can have too. But if we don't document it, we have little to say. Yep. It's interesting to hear you talk about the opportunities and challenges of integrating this sort of stuff into a rights-based approach. Um, but at, at, the beginning, at the beginning of the talk, you said that there's a rights-based sort of way of direct taking this, and a tenant-oriented or tenant rights or tenant-based. Tenant can you say more about the yeah. tenant side? Probably today the the tenant issue in the right in the right to housing is the weakest. Very weak, very little interest. When you have transformation of cities, um, and you look at the proportion of the people who have a title, you know, a, a, a contract, it's, it's tiny. Even in, I was this morning speaking with with one of you. And uh, we were speaking about Boston and, and Cambridge, you know, on, on some uh, renewal. All the Brazilians are absolutely no contract, etc. So in any movement, they are unprotected. And what is worse is that the guy who is doing that for the UN is a very neoliberal. So one of the most, Alan Gilbert, you know, who is from my university, unfortunately. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I can say it and say to the dictation, of course. Yeah, very neoliberal in the sense that it has to be regulated, etc., but without recognizing that, I mean, the most fragile population are the tenants, and there is nothing, you know, it's a little bit like for communal and collective forms of tenure. These were sort of gray areas, and if you ask me how would we connect collective and forms of tenure and rental, I don't know, still. I could, I could know for 
the formal contract. But all those who are there against paying services, who are sub, um, sub renters, how can they be part of a CIT? How can they? I don't know. How could they be part of an. In a Nuzukapian, as it's on views, it's fine. But when you look at how it is in a favela, and those who are, I mean, some of less rights, you know, so how do you count them? Are they going to, to have the same rights? The domestic worker who works in the place uh, with her kid that sleep there, is she going to be benef to, to benefit from the Uzukapian? Hmm. Or is it going to be a reproduction of the social system which is oppressive? This is the kind of, of subject that we hope in the future to, to unpack. Very little on it. And very few federations in the developing countries uh, are working on, on rental, uh, uh, rental issues. Yeah. I didn't quite understand what the problem was in the, uh, in the Uruguayan case of, with the mutual aid uh, on, the, on the ownership. Why the gentrification was forced? What, why can't they work out some sort of financing scheme for the people coming in? Yeah. Well, Basically, say you. I mean, isn't it just a matter of let's say the, the social? No, it, it's, it's because you know it's it, it's interesting because it's the rule, the, the very rule of the people. It's the full value. It's not something which comes from a law. Right. So it's, it's them basically them. destroying. It. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. They could preserve it if they want. I think so. Yeah. Okay. And right. I speak with with the full value friend. You see, I would say thirty percent of your if. The value of, the, of your labor is 15% yes. plus your loan. Say so you are speaking about, I mean, the social value of, of what you are getting is 30%, which isn't bad, you know, right. of, of, of your home. So it's uh, for a, a place which might be costing $100,000, it's $30,000, which, which means a lot. So these people, it's doubly, it's twice unfair. Because the one who has been working, is going to receive 15,000 today, okay? Right. Say, social value is 30,000 out of the house of 100,000. He will receive 15,000 today for his social value and 15,000 within three years, which is technically the time that maybe it's needed to repair the home and sell it back, okay? That's the rationale behind it. So this guy of family who is living has not the same has not, we have the capacity to, to get a new place to, to buy or, or rent only within three years. So he's not a big beneficiary. But the newcomer, he will have to put this 30,000 plus the price of the, of the, he will have to pay the, for the full price. So he, well, why can't you just find that? That's what is being discussed. Okay. This is being discussed, and as the government, with, with the uh, current president and the ministry minister of housing, is a guy which was from CESE, which from the, uh, the, the Center for uh, Cooperative Housing, the advisors, and, uh, 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 I mean a good guy, true. Um, they are working on that. But there, <coughs> yeah. there is an, an inherent asymmetry that makes it difficult because <coughs> the original people who participate self-built so that they can contribute time. Yeah. But there's not, the new people, the thing's already built, and there's That's not, so there's a, there is an inherent asymmetry which will bias it towards wealthier newcomers, which it's hard to see how a financing scheme can erase that because the whole reason for the self-building was because there wasn't finance available for poor people to just buy things. So they bought things through time. The newcomers would have to self-build a new, you know, it's a new vacant lot or something, but if they're going to actually move into an already built thing, I don't know. There's other work to be done that they could yeah, do. But, yeah, but, but not but the same expect, attitude and over. But, but <laughs> you know, we had exactly the same issue in, in, in Brazil when I was doing the sign, you know, with poor people. And uh, 
what is possible and is part of the, of, of the conversation you know, within the movement is that why don't think if I'm going to, to get a piece of, uh, if I'm going to be in this neighborhood, to go towards the city in the sense that I will contribute, say, you work 1,000 hours, usually it's 1,500 hours, okay. Why over 10 years, over five years, couldn't I contribute <coughs> with 1,500 hours with me and my family to maybe build a, a skateboard uh, for the kids or a, a, a place for dancing or some collective contribution which will improve not the house, because it's a restrictive notion of the home, or build, uh, you know, you have to, uh, I did the research on, on pigs, you know, on pigs in cities and all, all that, you know, which is very, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and I saw that <laughs> urban pigs, you know, it was very popular. When was urban pigs. Pigs. <laughs> very popular <laughs> because no it was. proposals for pigs in cities that I yeah. know of. Yeah. And, and I, it was to control it. And so the mayor, well, I was in the UN and I proposed something on urban pigs and everybody loved it because, I mean, there was all the noise. Pounding on four other pigs, you know, etc. Et but you know, we have 6,000 pigs, and you could precisely have places to raise these pigs who are eating the, the, the waste and the organic waste. You could have places for um, incubators, for uh, jars. You can do with 15. I think the best asset is not to think about money, it is not. It's to say, okay, uh, the, the house is there, why do you want to make money out of it? This is stupid. It's much better to say there is a social energy, 1,500 hours, which are free, and that could be to plant trees, that could be to improve the, the, the place, you see. So my debate is much more on decommodifying the, 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 the city and pushing one step forward. Maybe I'm wrong. It's, it's more the, the, the kind of, of debate that I'm trying to do. If, we have, if you sell 10 houses, you have 15,000 hours of social energy, can you imagine what um, in, in this so small, small neighborhood you could do a lot? So, but they are not going towards that. They are going to financial device in order to uh, to have these people having loans to pay over ten uh, or something the equivalent <coughs> of the social work. Well, you could combine the two. I mean, you could have someone come in and say, "Look, I'm going to give uh, you yeah. know 1,500 hours or whatever it is. I'm going to build a, a pig." Capo lot in the urban area, which, you know, yeah, which is but whatever. Yeah, there. Or a big park or the skateboard. But the, the other person can be wants to sell, can still be compensated for some sort of money. Yeah. I don't see the two intention but necessarily. But they could <coughs> be intention. However, this I think in terms of mixed use, mixed social use, is quite good because in, uh, and I mean the research on that precisely, I mean in, in the 80s, um, which was comparing these. Uh, the auto uh, previous savings system. If you had money, you were previous right. savings, you know. And if you had no money, you were labor, I mean, this mutual aid. But you had two very different types of spaces being produced, you know, of cities being produced. And they were not matching. So I see a value in having, as you say, people who have no resource and we will pay with their hours, you know, mm -hmm. contrib socially contributing, which is, I mean, the best way to improve the city for the unemployed or, or, the, or those who don't want to work uh, in companies or whatever, and to have mixed. And those who have a little bit of money, okay, gentrify slightly, but you produce mixed. But it, it's a field of debate. I'm, I'm no, no. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, what about um, doing shared equity or limited equity um, cooperatives, I mean, for, for that example? I mean, is that something that's being talked about yeah. in, mm -hmm. in Brazil? You in see, that that, that's something I had. Uh, I was calculating uh, you know, to do like yesterday, so I limited myself to 30 slides, you know. But I have one, which is like the new thinking, you know, Pat, uh, Pat Conaty, I don't know, new economies, I mean, people who are Americans, but in, in, in the UK and, and who are small groups, you know, on CLTs and garden mm -hmm. cities, etc. So now, the big thing is, and it should be used for, uh, you know, Robert Owen, uh, Owen, you know, this uh, co-op, mm -hmm. okay. Landmark, etc. So there's a Owen Town now, which is being built, which is like a new utopia, very interesting for those uh, interested in that. But the model which is under debate today, and I think it could be interesting, it has a name, C-H-N-O-P, I mean an impossible name to remember. But basically, it's, it's exactly what you said. You would have the sum of three things. Now, this is like the 
uh, new way of those working on, which is very much linked to city and housing and affordability and all. Which would be, and one is in that construction, and Owen City, Owen Town could be that next, is to, to marry, to make an assemblage or a ménage à trois, as, as we saw <laughs> yesterday in Eric's place, uh, an assemblage of three things. CLT for the land, freeze it, it's not a commodity, that's one. Mm -hmm. Then shared equity, and then you pay according to your resources, etc. And to maintain the uh, Hebenes Howard vision of a city, to scale it up, mm -hmm. to get mixed use and a productive city with public spaces and housing. Mm -hmm. You know, this sort of envisioning of a city which was, I mean, one of the first city plans for workers. It's important in the, in the social history of planning to, to remember that. So this is more or less where uh, it's, uh, I mean, one line of thinking and, uh, and, and thinkers are, uh, and I think it could give good elements because there's, uh, I mean, it's not, the three pieces work well so it's taking a little bit from the Swedish model, but that's why I took it, because I wanted to reach that point here. Yeah. The Swedish model, which works right here. Well, the CLTs, which are now um, done. And, um, and the old uh, envisioning of cities by uh, Celtic. So this, and this is under construction. Yeah, I mean, the first mm. one, the hybrid between a CLT and a shared equity. Yeah. And then the third piece is that it would be mixed use, not just residential. <laughs> Absolutely, but it will be planned, you know, to get, I mean, the public spaces, um, industrial uh, areas, food production, I mean, to, to get it much more inbuilt as, as, a, as, a, as a city, mm -hmm. as, which all the institutes, you know, with what, all what it says on, because the CLT, you get, you get very little of the CLT. When I compare with, with the city, you know, you go to Burlington, if I take like three cases of 35,000 people, you know, Marga Pata, uh, you go to, to Burlington, I mean, it's amazing. $10 million in a city of uh, that. When I divide by the number of inhabitants and I compare with all my cities on PB that I'm studying constantly, this is a very, very high number. It's a lot of money that you are re-injecting in a city. Mm -hmm. How do you increase you know, based on, on the increase of the value of the city to get something significant, to get a high standard of living for people, you know, good quality of life. They get grants, they get trips to go somewhere. It's very different because it's a lot of money. So I think that it's not only a, a vision of a, a city which mixed use, you know, in a planning sense. No, it's, it's a place that you are going to increase because it, you generate jobs wealth and the wealth is re-injected for the benefit of the, of the population at an astronomically higher rate than in a CIT. Mm -hmm. you see? Yeah. So do you see any inherent limits to this last example to scalability, to like places that are much bigger than 33,000 inhabitants? Well, you see, we went with Philip, my, my friend from, uh, uh, we went the three, uh, two from Letchworth, the CEO from the Heritage Trust, the ex-mayor, super politician, myself, in China, in Chengdu, who, that they wanted to be, uh, 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 they wanted to be uh, a garden city, etc. You know, and there's a lot of land on communes, and they have a very interesting land. I think. So we said, okay, what about the CLTs? And we took them to Letchworth, and they saw that a company was there with lots of money, and they were thrilled because this is what they like, you know, it was business. You know, 10 million profit in a small place, super. So they loved it. Mm. Not necessarily for the good reasons, I don't know if they would reinvest <laughs> the 10 million for the benefit of the community. That's another story, but they saw that this is business. So they said, okay. We went there, and the result was very simple. Okay, Letchworth was 30,000 inhabitants, we could do a small, uh, a slightly bigger one for Chengdu, and they offered us to be in charge of uh, building one of 900,000 inhabitants. And so we're three guys, you know. And then we said, what can we do? 
And then the mayor was put in, in jail for because he was corrupted. So it was the end. Of, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the end of the trip. <laughs> small, small detail, which <laughs> now I, we, cannot say, we cannot say Garden City is for uh, TV comes back or uh, a new uh, or East for Garden City. You know, so at the point in time, they wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And when I speak with the, I, I work in the Chinese Academy of Urban Planning and Design for, for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And the guys are quite interested. What we are lacking is the capacity to envision. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, when I see my students or, you know, 20 people who would go to set up, a, to design a city of 1 million inhabitants, which would be a CLT, but, you know, man, we are a handful of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the possibility is absolutely there. And they are telling us. So yes, there is possibility, but we don't have the capacity to go beyond a small scale. We need lectures, courses in universities, research, data, mechanisms uh, to be able to challenge the system. You know, and uh, I remember having a, a beer with my friends. You know, when they said, "Okay, 900,000 inhabitants," and we were the three of us, and totally lost. You know. And good precious, he was put into jail. That's the same on the case. All right. Um, so a lot of the examples you talked about and what you were just saying seem to have arisen pretty organically out of revolutions or um, expansion or local politicians who are interested in bringing the model in. Um, was there a particular, I'm interested in, I'm a classicist and I, I yeah. do disaster in, in the ancient world and utopian uh, forms as a response to in the ancient world, it's really threats from the outside, but so I'm wondering if there's a particular model that you see is particularly well suited to people who are either displaced because of uh -huh. war and violence or because of natural disaster, or if it's that situation where there's the, the desperate need across the basage rather than um, a group that's kind of organically coming mm -hmm. together to do it on their own. Well, what I, I can share with you is um, the debates we have in Haiti. That's another place where I should be now, or I could go from here. Uh, we work in, in, in Haiti in the rebuilding, you know, with the Red Cross, with people very open to these ideas. And um, I, know, I discuss with ministers and all that on setting up CLTs in places which are totally wrecked. You know, very low profile, gangsterism on top of poverty. And, and they are interested, it's been under discussion, but again, so yes, it could be done. Uh, the authorities are convinced, but there are very few people able to turn this political willingness uh, into reality. And the community leaders, you had a good transfer from the uh, Uruguayan model, small co-op, you know, 60 houses, etc. This works. And the guys came and, uh, from Central America, but very small scale. But if you want to go, as you say, you know, on something which would be, which is the scale that right, would be perfectly possible, 30,000, 50,000, you know, Carrefour, so, I mean, the big places which were destroyed, etc. Perfectly possible. And, and all the tools are there. But to have, to have this conversation with people, they grab immediately the idea of lots of organizations. So you need uh, to invest on that. And aid is not interested in that. Aid is interested to show I mean, a couple of tents and some big kitten, uh, see how good it is, and, uh, and all that. It's, uh, it's, it's another business. But if it, yes, CNTs could be uh, an, an incredible uh, solution you know, to, to reinvest. Or, uh, and people are the Dominicans are regularly going and doing a great job on that. So it's through people that the transfer is going on. And uh, the rebuilding in Sichuan, you know, close to Chengdu, was uh, done uh, very conventionally. And when I discussed with the guys in charge of that, they told me, yes, we could have done it, but we didn't know. You know so it's, uh, it's not impossible. Um, you need advocate and show that it works, you know. Yeah. 
I suppose that time is over. Yeah, so I, I do have an issue I'd like to raise, but I guess I can do it. We'll, we'll have another two hours, or an hour and a half tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, let me just close it, but we'll, the discussion I think should, which is, it's really a two-part question. One is, it seems to me the governance structure of the CLT matters, not just to make it work well, but it's actually at the core of why it works at all. Because if you had a mob-controlled CLT, it would function like private property. That is, the locational advantage of having a CLT close to where people want to live would enable, would mean that the buildings on it would absorb all the locational value that you normally think of as part of the land. If the people controlling the, this trust wanted it to come out that way. So it's really their capacity to regulate what's happening on the land and how it changes, how the property rights around incumbency get transferred that really give you all these advantages. And therefore, the governance structure of the CLT needs a lot of attention, it seems mm -hmm. to me. Rather than just this, the device of taking it out of the market and having it in perpetuity and a trust, mm -hmm. it would seem to me, at least, that that's true. I mean, I see your... Well, that was the big contribution of Bob Swan, who was one of the great thinkers and writers in the CLT movement, was the tripartite model where the community had it. Yeah, so that seems to me really crucial. Well, in, in a sense, community represents the future yeah. interest, the future homeowner, who, uh, so that it's just not the people currently living in housing who are act, they can act in their self-interest entirely. And that's great, but they never have enough votes to control the process. They always have to, you know, so people have to negotiate with each other. In practice, uh, it's messy, and it's intended to be like that. But it's not this elegant scene model. It's true democracy is really, it's, uh, it's hard, things take a long time, it's, uh, you gotta hang in there, but it, it works, but it's not simple in practice. But Bob Swan stuff is great. And by the way, the CLT Reader is a fantastic book. Who here's read it? Yes, yeah, it's got to be nice <laughs> All right. And, you, and it's only 12 bucks uh, as a Kindle book now? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, good. Yeah. Well, I think we should. But I think that we can speak of the governance model. I don't want to expand now because I discussed that in China, you know, on the Trump side. Discussed it in in, uh, in Belgium, it worked. And uh, I'll tell you more about the tripartite powers in, in, in China because they are, you're absolutely right. I think that this, I mean, all the innovations in Formula, which relates to the management issue that you are raising in your paper on urban agriculture and NCS, is, is something that we might mm. get a closer look uh, into and I have serious doubts and questions about that. All right. Great. So, pleasure.